driving through Texas, a New Yorker collided with a truck carrying a horse. A few months later, he tried to collect damages for his injuries. How can you claim to have all these injuries, asked the insurance company's lawyer. According to the police report, at the time, you said that you were unhurt. Well, it's like this, this, said the New Yorker. I was lying on the road in a lot of pain, and I heard someone say that the horse had a broken leg. The next thing I knew, the sheriff pulled out his gun and shot the horse. Then he turned to me and said, are you okay? Sometimes it's easy to misunderstand. Some people are just getting it slowly. Some people are, sometimes it's easy to misunderstand what people are saying to us. And that can happen with the Bible too. Especially because there are some Bible passages that are really difficult to understand. We're allowed to say that because the Apostle Peter actually said that. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and 16, Peter said about Paul's writings, he, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand. And that's true of our passage this morning. Bible scholar Craig Bloomberg said that this passage is probably the most complex, controversial and opaque of any text of comparable length in the New Testament. And so over the years, Christians have argued and fought over what this passage uh, really teaches us and how we should apply it today. So it's okay if you struggle to understand everything in this passage this morning. I do. Okay? And it's okay if we disagree over some of the details. We can humbly accept that this is just one of those passages that Christians, sincere Bible-believing Christians, disagree over. But this passage is still God's Word for us today. So it's still useful for our lives. So it's worth taking the time to trying to understand what it's saying. And as we do, I hope that we actually see that it is relevant for us as we seek to celebrate God's design for our lives. So our passage this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and it's verse 2 down to verse 16, and Philip is going to come up, and he's going to read it for us this morning. Thanks, Philip. Good morning. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For a woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For long hair is given to her as a covering. 
If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Thank you very much, Philip, for reading our passage uh, this morning. This passage is about the, the crucial principle of headship. Thirteen times in this little section, Paul uses the word head. Now, sometimes he's talking about our physical head. He's talking about it literally. But then other times, there's a play in words here. And he's using the word head figuratively. So, for example, in in verse 3, he says, The head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. And when used figuratively in this way, head can have two meanings. First of all, it can mean source, the source of something, like the head waters of a river. And then secondly, it can mean authority, the one that we submit to, like a head teacher or a head chef. And it seems that Paul was actually using both of those meanings in this passage, both the source and the one that we submit to. So, God is the head of Christ, because he is the source of Christ, in the sense that Christ came from the Father, full of grace and truth, as it says in John chapter 1. But God is also the one that Christ submits to. Remember Jesus, we looked at uh, John cha- uh, the, the Gospel of John a, a little while ago and we read in John chapter 12, Jesus saying, I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. So Christ submitted to his Father throughout his whole ministry. And then in a similar way, Christ is the head of man because he was created Because man was created by Christ. That's why man is described as the image and the glory of God. He was made by Christ to resemble him and to reflect his glory in this world. And because of this, man is called to submit to Christ. So men are called to accept him as the head of the body the church. Now, of course, women are also made in the image of God. We'll think about that in a little bit. Women are also made to reflect the glory of God and to submit to him. But crucially here, in God's design, women were created from man. As we've read recently in Genesis chapter 2, if you're following our reading plan, man was created first Then woman was formed from man from one of his ribs. Paul says this in verse 8. Man did not come from woman, but woman from man. So that means that man is the head or the source of woman. And it also means in some specific and limited ways that women are called to submit to men. So, for example, Ephesians chapter 5, one of the the most famous passages in the Bible about marriage. In Christian marriage, wives are called to submit to to the leadership of their husbands. And just in case the husbands think, well, that's great because we get the the easy end of that, that bargain, husbands are also called to lay down their lives for the sake of their wives. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and 3, headship explains why some men are responsible for the leadership and the teaching responsibility in the local church. So this is a clear principle throughout the the Bible. The principle of headship. God's created order. But we need to be really clear here. None of this gives an excuse for a man to look down on or to treat badly a woman. 
It doesn't mean that the woman is in any way inferior. Okay? After all, as we see, Paul relates the headship between the man and the woman to the headship between Christ and his father. And Christ is in no way inferior to his father, is he? Remember John chapter 10 when Jesus said, I and the Father are one. They are equally God. No inferiority between Christ and his Father. No inferiority between man and woman. They are equally made in the image of God. They have equal status, equal value. Paul reflected this truth in this passage. Look at verse 9. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Now that points to the equality of woman to man. Let me explain. This refers to again to the book of Genesis, where God gives the reason for why he created Eve. He says in Genesis chapter 2, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Woman was created because man needed a helper. A companion who would be his equal and could, would provide him the strength that he needed. Okay? And none of the animals were qualified for that because none of the animals were his equal. But the woman was. Eve was his equal. And so the woman was a helper suitable for him. And as a result, woman is the glory of man. She was created out of him and for him, and completes him, and so brings glory to him, reflects who he really is, because she is of equal value and status to him. This equality is also emphasized in verse 11 of this passage. In the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, nor man is independent of woman. Men and women need each other. They are interdependent. And Paul goes on in verse 12. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. So we all depend on God for life. Without God, we would not have life. But we cannot survive without each other. This is the way that God has created life. At the beginning, woman came from man. And at birth, every man comes from a woman. We are interdependent. We need each other. And this equality of men and women is a key truth in the church. So Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, Male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. So this is the crucial principle of headship. Men and women are equal, but different. As Christ is equal with the Father, and yet the Father is also the head of Christ, and they have a distinct role, So the woman is created equal with the man. But the man is called to be the head of the woman. And they have different roles in God's world. And if that is how God has created his world, then we as believers in Jesus, we as children of God, we are called to accept this and submit to how God has designed us to live and to serve him either in our maleness or in our femaleness. This is how we honour the one who created us and loved us and gave himself up 
for us. And that's why Paul wrote to the Corinthians about head coverings. Because it seems that some of the people in this church were rebelling against this principle of headship by rejecting that common practice of head coverings in their church gatherings. Have a look at verse 4 and 5. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonours his head. And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonours her head. Now seemingly, those who have studied this culture understand that the head covering was like a hood. Okay? Not a fancy hat that we might see these days, but just a hood that the women pulled up over their heads. And Paul said that when they pray or prophesy in the local church gatherings, men should not wear them. But women should wear them. But why? And why did it matter? Well, I believe it's because of what a head covering, what the meaning of that, what it symbolised in that society in that day. So look at verse 6. Paul goes on to explain this. He says, If a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. And if it's a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut or shaved off, she should cover her head. Paul and the Corinthians knew that in that culture, a woman having an uncovered head was seen as a disgraceful thing. It was just as bad in that culture as a woman having her hair cut short or shaved off. It placed that woman among those who were seen as the dishonoured, the disgraced. Now, I would guess that most of us are part of a culture where we don't see that as being a disgraceful thing. A woman appearing in public with her head uncovered, like ladies most of you are this morning, or her hair cut, doesn't have any negative implication. Nobody is shocked by that. Nobody is, is disgraced by that. Nobody sees that as being a terrible thing. So it seems that Paul here is referring to a commonly accepted understanding in that first century culture as to do with heads and hair. And the scholars that have studied this issue, they tell us that this is because head covering was seen as a distinction between men and women. Only women wore these head coverings. And they also say that women who acted as temple prostitutes or who had been caught in adultery, did not cover their heads. So a woman covering her head with this hood was a symbol of her accepting her femaleness and also a declaration of her faithfulness to her husband. In that culture, head covering and hair length had a moral significance. It was an outward sign of what was going on inside in that woman's life. And that's why Paul could ask the Corinthians in verse 13, judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray with her head, pray to God with her head uncovered? from what they knew, from how they were living, from how they had been brought up, they should be able to clearly see that a woman worshipping God without a head covering was just not appropriate. It's also why Paul appealed to nature. Look at verse 14, please. Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a disgrace for him? But that if a woman has long hair, it's for, it is her glory. For long hair is given to her as a covering. Now, what does the nature of things mean? Well, it's not about nature as in, you know, mother nature. You know how people talk about nature in that sense. You know, men's hair does grow long if you let it. 
Never tried it. Looked kind of funny on me, but then mind. Woman's hair does also grow long. Neither does it mean just that that's, this is, a, this is a, a principle that's been applied right throughout time and it's forever. Because in some cultures there isn't that nature of things that tells you that it's a disgrace for a man to have long hair. Even in the Bible, some of the people in the Bible, they had long hair. In fact, when a man made a Nazarite vow, a vow of commitment to God, he didn't cover, cut his hair, hair. That's why Samson, if you remember in the Old Testament, had long hair as a sign of his dedication to God. So the nature of things is not just uh, the biology, neither is it just something that's happened, uh, a truth that's, that, that covers across time, but rather it's the natural feelings of a contemporary culture. It's what you just feel by instinct because you're part of this culture. So their culture told them, as a general rule, men should have short hair, women should have long hair. So in their society, it informed them that for for women, her hair was her glory. It was a covering. It was a means of distinguishing her from the men. Therefore, to remove it, or to remove her hood, was to bring disgrace. It was her rejecting the fact that she was a female. Now I think this helps us to understand the connection between the biblical principle of headship and how this was expressed with a covered head in that society. So if a woman did not cover her head, then it sent out a message that she was in some way abandoning her femaleness. And she was making a culturally understandable statement of rejecting her role in that marriage, of submitting to her husband. She was dressing in a way that indicated that she was rebelling against her God-given role as a woman and her acceptance of the headship of man. In a similar way, if a man was was to cover his head, he would be abandoning his maleness and his role as the head of his wife. He would be demonstrating he didn't want that responsibility. He didn't want that burden. And so Paul encouraged this church not to reject this symbol. Instead, they were to maintain the practice Because it expressed the truth. The biblical truth that men and women in Christ are equal and dependent on each other. But in God's plan they are distinct. And there's a headship order that reflects the headship of God. So this this contemporary cultural symbol was reflecting a biblical truth. And so Paul said, don't get rid of it. Hold on to it. Keep it. I think that's also why a woman's covered head was seen as, verse 10, a sign of authority. Now, again, there's loads and loads of arguments over what this means. But interestingly, this is the same word, this word authority. In the original language, it's the same word as used in chapter 8 and 9 that is translated freedom or right. Remember we were looking at chapter 8 and 9 about the the rights, the freedoms we have as Christians and how we should set them aside for the benefit of others. That's that same word. So in the synagogue, women did not have the freedom, the right to speak. But now in Christ, they did have that freedom, that right to pray or to prophesy in the church services. And so a woman's head covering was a symbol of her freedom to do that because it declared that even although she was standing up and speaking or praying, she was still submitting to God's design for headship. It wasn't an act of rebellion. It was an expression of her acceptance of her role that God had given her. And maybe this is also why Paul said that women should do it because of the angels. Again, There's lots and lots of different ideas about what that means. 
And that's all the Bible says about it. So, you know, you need to hold those, those ideas very loosely in terms of what it means. But I think it maybe simply means that, women, that angels too are interested in seeing God's created order respected by God's people. So hopefully you're with me so far. I'm not really sure if you are or not. But what Paul wanted the Corinthians to do, I think, in this passage is really clear. Paul wanted the the, the people in this church, the men should uncover their heads when they pray and prophesy, and the the, the women should have them covered. I think that's clear. Men should keep them uh, uncovered, women should have them covered covered. But the complication is, what does that mean for us today? How should we take this passage and apply it to our lives living in Ireland in the 21st century? And that is not a straightforward question. It's not a case of, oh well Paul told the Corinthians to do this, so we should do exactly the same. That's not always the right way to understand how to apply the Bible. Sometimes we should hold on to the principle of what the Bible teaches us, but not necessarily the practice. Let me give you a a maybe clearer example of this. When Jesus washed the disciples' feet, do you remember this in John chapter 13? Jesus said, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Okay, You also should wash one another's feet. Jesus said it. It's a command from him. So does that mean we should obey Jesus' teaching in our lives? Well, of course we should. But not necessarily by washing feet. Because when Jesus said that, he wasn't introducing a new custom, a new practice of feet washing. He wasn't introducing something that people had never done before. That was already a common thing to do. In fact, if you went to people's house for dinner, you would always have your feet washed or you'd wash them yourself. But what Jesus was teaching was, who should do it? That they, as Jesus' disciples, should be willing to humble themselves and do what was seen as the lowest form of service in that culture. So today... When we read John chapter 13, verse 14, we absolutely should say, Jesus, you commanded me to do that, so I need to put this into practice. But not by imposing a practice of feet washing, but by holding on to the principle to be able to to be willing to humble ourselves and do the lowest act of service for people in our lives. Okay? So what what about when we come to this this issue of head covering? Should we keep the practice or just the principle behind it? Well, some Christians believe that women today should wear, wear head coverings in times of collective worship, just as they did in the church in Corinth. They stress that that principle of headship and the practice of head covering are so linked, so intertwined, that you just can't have one without the other. And I think we need to respect people's conviction on that issue. And if that is your deeply held conviction, if that's what the Bible teaches, then please feel free to come, ladies, and cover your head in church. Men, make sure that your head is uncovered in church, if that's what you believe. We don't want to ridicule or condemn anybody for holding on to that understanding. But I think that although the principle of headship is crucially important, this passage does not impose a practice to express it. Rather, it teaches the church not to remove that culturally accepted way of expressing the distinction between men and women. Because that would indicate that they were rebelling against God's order of headship. 
So today, the practice of head coverings does not carry this understanding of male and female distinction or disgrace or rebellion. It doesn't have that meaning in our society. Asking women to wear them in church is to ask them to do something abnormal rather than something normal, which was what Paul wanted to avoid here. He was just calling them to continue the the cultural practice here. He wanted them to do something that was normal in their culture, in reflecting their womanhood and their creative, the creative order and the distinction between the sexes. So I know that some people do believe that you need to hold on to the practice as well as the principle, but I believe that we should hold on to the principle without necessarily imposing the practice. So if that's the case then, And just finally, we just need to think about, well, how do we apply this today? How can we hold on to this practice without imposing an idea of a head covering? Let me just give you a couple of examples. We live in a world today that increasingly is rejecting and trying to force us to reject the binary view of gender. That we are distinctly male and female. That idea is being increasingly rejected. It's being taught. It's being imposed on us. And I know that some people have real, genuine struggles about this issue. So, we need to treat them with love and compassion. No place for ridicule. No place for condemnation. No place for calling people names or treating people badly or not expressing love to them. Of course, okay? But as believers in Jesus... We need to accept how God has designed this world. That God created man in his own image. In in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. That's how God created this world. So we should reject the world's attempts to blur the distinction between the sexes. God created men and women as different. So we should not try to remove all those differences. There's lots and lots of implications of that. We need to think through and be careful that we think through. Rather than imposing stereotypes on what it means to be a man and a woman. We're not saying that. But there's lots of ways that that applies. One of the ways is about the clothes that we wear. We can actually see this back in the Old Testament law. Deuteronomy 25, 22, verse 5. A woman must not wear men's clothing, nor a man wear women's clothing. For the Lord your God detests anyone who does this. So in the Old Testament law, God wanted men and women to dress in a way that reflected the fact that God had created them differently. A little bit similar to how we're talking about in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. So I think that's how we should act today. Men should dress like men and women should dress like women. Now this of course needs to be adapted to our culture. Okay? You can't say, well that means that women should not wear trousers, for example. Okay? Because trousers is a, a, a recent in, invention. I don't think Jesus wore trousers, did he? I'm not sure. So we're not going to go back, way back. Because if you go say, oh no, we need to go back to a previous culture where we'd all be wearing animal skins. And that's not maybe that comfortable. Especially if you get an allergy to some of those animals. So we need to adapt this to our culture. Okay, so in our culture we need to make sure that we men are wearing men's clothes and, and women are wearing women's clothes. Let me give you an example of why we need to adapt this culture. I would never come here dressed with a skirt on. You'll be really glad to hear that. But I did get married with a kilt. And I'm not going to show you a picture. <laughs> I'm sure you're glad. Okay? Because in Scotland, a kilt is not women's clothes, it's a, it's, it's a guy's clothes. Very manly way of dressing. And we had. So we need to understand this in a culturally sensitive way. But hold on to the fact that we as men should be wearing men's clothes and women should be wearing women's clothes. 
One other little example. We live in a, in a society where the idea of a difference or distinction in the role of men and women is rejected and ridiculed as old-fashioned or restrictive or unfair. If a woman is not allowed to do everything a man does and a man is not allowed to do everything a woman does, then that's wrong. But as followers of Jesus, we need to accept God's design for headship. And so women and men are equal. But in some limited situations, we're given different roles. Now this has got nothing to do with who is the breadwinner of the family. Or who is the primary caregiver in the house. Or guys, who does the dishes or the housework. It's nothing to do with that. It's about spiritual leadership in the home and spiritual leadership in the church. And we'll see Paul touching on that again in chapter 14 of this letter. So this is a challenging passage of scripture. And hopefully you've you've understood something of what I've been saying. But if you still have questions, please just come and I'll, I'll chat with you and I'll try to explain it a little bit better. But I hope that we can see that it's still relevant for us today. It speaks into, probably in my lifetime now, more relevantly than ever before into the issues that we are facing as Christians living in 21st century Ireland. So if we have trusted in Jesus and we've accepted him as our Saviour and Lord, we need to understand and accept how God has planned us to live so that we can honour him in our lives. And we do that not by following what our culture, what our society tells us to do, but by celebrating God's design.